I have a difficult topic to, uh, to discuss this evening. 1943 is probably the most difficult year of, of World War II to, to write about for an author or, or indeed to, uh, uh, to try to get a handle on. And uh, let me explain a little bit about why that is so, uh, uh, kind of preliminary remarks. The attempt by the Axis powers uh, to win the war quickly, which they all knew they had to do if they were going to win it at all, before their enemies could muster superior resources, had failed by 1943. Uh, those allied resources were now beginning to tell. And yet, that sounds clear cut, and yet, Axis forces had driven far forward enough in their initial offensives that they were sitting everywhere in strong defensive positions well forward uh, from where the Allies stood as 1943 dawned. It was a long, long way to Rome, Berlin, or Tokyo. Uh, the Allies, I think by 1943, could see eventual victory. They did know they were going to win the war. But they also knew by now that it was going to be a long and hard and very bloody road. And in that sense, 1943 is the hardest year of the war for all concerned, since everyone's short war illusions had been shattered. You know, I thought about this a long, long time, and I can't imagine ever in the history of, of warfare that any military establishment has ever gone to its civilian masters and said, you know what, it's going to be a long, long war. It's always the opposite. It's always promised to be the opposite. Yeah, we can do this. How long is it going to take? Well, it's not going to be, it won't take that long. It'll be over soon. Uh, the classic trope, of course, is the war will be over by a, what, what's the holiday? Christmas. The war's going to be over by Christmas. And then it's the war's over by next Christmas. Bill Clinton once famously told us that the troops would be out of Bosnia by Christmas. Christmas of 2057. Now, for the Germans, and I'm going to be concentrating my remarks on the Germans tonight because it's what I know best, the war had opened with an amazing run of uh, victory from 1939 to 1941. Every student of the war, I suppose, knows something about this chronology, uh, but there's Poland in September of 1939, Norway and Denmark, the Scandinavian campaign, France in 1940, and the Low Countries, Belgium and the Netherlands. The campaign in the Balkans in 1941, over almost before it got started. The Germans overran Yugoslavia and took about 800,000 prisoners and suffered 362 casualties. Then there was an airdrop on Crete, perhaps the most uh, exciting moment of this early phase of World War II in which the Germans carried out the occupation of an island uh, solely by, uh, by airborne means alone, which could not have made the British sleep all that well. Then there was the opening of Operation Barbarossa, the first six months at least, from June to December 1941, in which the Germans inflicted no fewer than four million casualties on the forces of the Red Army in that period. Three million of them were prisoners in the largest battles of encirclement. The Germans have the term Kesselschlacht, the largest battles of encirclement that have ever been, uh, uh, ever been affected. Uh, the, the battle in front of Kiev, probably in September of 1941, probably took around 700 or 750,000 prisoners of war from the Red Army. So the Red Army had essentially been, at least Red Army version 1.0, had essentially been destroyed somewhere between June and December of 1941. And we'll talk about what might have happened in December in a moment. Now the formula for each one of these dramatic victories uh, was essentially a long-standing German operational tradition. Now, it's the B word in my business, and it's not blitzkrieg, uh, which is a term with high sex appeal amongst the reading public in World War II. The German term actually is Bewegungskrieg, which is a lot less well-known, but it translates as the war of movement. Bewegung in German is movement, so the war of movement. And the Germans use that on the operational level. Uh, that is to say the the, the movement, the maneuver of large units, uh, uh, maybe division, but core on up, core armies and army groups. So it was Bewegungskrieg, the war of movement on the operational level. Aggressive, even reckless attacks on every target of opportunity. Concentric attacks, seeking again what the Germans called the Kessel Schlacht. A Kessel is a cattle or a cauldron. So it's a cauldron battle, but really a battle of encirclement. Now, by, and so, essentially, I believe I have a Britney Spears mic, so I can walk around. 
You can hear me? This is astonishing. Um, essentially, it's how, uh, how this map was created. That is how the entire map of Europe uh, uh, turned blue, according to the map that you have here. So the German star with the invasion of Poland turned to the north in Scandinavia, to the west, France and the Low Countries, into the Balkans, and then, of course, the great campaign into the, uh, into the Soviet Union at this, uh, in June, starting in June of 1941. It's how this map uh, turned blue. I believe there, I have, by the way, for you tonight, an amazing PowerPoint of precisely two slides. <laughs> And this is, the, this is the second slide, and it's called How All the Blue Got Erased. And, and this is essentially the process that starts in 1943. You know, you can go to a publisher and say, I have a book about dramatic military victories, and the publisher is going to be all over that. But you go to a publisher with a book and say, I want to write about disillusionment. What are you going to call this book? Disillusionment. It's a loser in the, in the publishing world. And so it was a little bit difficult getting this idea sold. But it's, it's how, again, uh, map one turns into map two. And 1943 is the crucial year for, for that, uh, that development. By 1943, in other words, that run of victories was over. And it was a dramatic run. And it's so dramatic that, that uh, I think there's still lessons to be learned, both from, for historians, Operators, analysts of all sort can still study the opening years of World War II with, I think, some, uh, some profit. I don't pretend to know when the turning point of World War II actually took place. And, and I would ask you all to be as humble as I am in this particular instance and, and admit that you might not know either. It's a big war. It was a global conflict from the Arctic Circle to, to the South Atlantic and Pacific. And claiming that one discrete event had turned it from German victory to German defeat is, is probably a bit much. Um, was it 1942, November, with the El Alamein Stalingrad nexus, that is a big defeat for the Germans deep inside the Soviet Union? and a big defeat for the Germans uh, in, in the Western Desert in North Africa. These events happen within a week of one another. And, and that's often been a, a really good uh, candidate for turning point. I wrote a book on 1942, and I went out of my way not to use the word turning point. Uh, and, and I remember it got picked up. I was so lucky. It got picked up by the, uh, the military book club. And I remember saying, oh, I can put another daughter through college. These are always big moments. And the little brochure comes from the Military Book Club. Many of you have been members of it. You know, the, the brochure that describes the books. And there's my book, a featured selection, Death of the Wehrmacht, Robert Satino. Big headlines. Turning point of World War II. I've gone out of my way, but it's a, it's a term that, that, that people are sort of have an instinctive yearning for. What was the moment? So it could have been 1942, and many people would say that it was. It could have been December 1941. When the Germans got smashed in front of Moscow, I, I've, I came of age in reading about World War II in high school, and I always remember the German army was stopped outside of Moscow. That's sort of what I learned. And then I studied it a little more, and oh yes, it was stopped in front of Moscow, and then it was nearly destroyed by a gigantic Soviet counteroffensive. So stopped doesn't even do it justice. Um, up till that moment, the Germans had taken very minimal casualties in the first two years of the war. After the airdrop on Crete, when the Germans, uh, an, an airborne division had dropped on Crete, and taken some casualties, four or 5,000 men out of a 12,000-man division, so nobody should underplay that. They were heavy casualties. But, but Hitler said, well, we can never do that again. That was too bloody. That was too expensive. But the next month, he invaded the Soviet Union. <laughs> and, and every day brought casualties that probably were five times the number of casualties sustained on Crete every day for the rest of the war. And really, that process comes to a culmination in front of Moscow in December of 1941. A, a relatively blood, uh, blood I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating. A war that had featured minimal casualties for the Germans now suddenly generated one million German casualties. And so if you're looking for a turning point in World War II, perhaps December of 1941 uh, can be your choice. But we can go further back. Perhaps Hitler's decision to launch Operation Barbarossa in the first place, that is to invade the Soviet Union. Up till now, he'd had things his own way. Couldn't figure out a way to beat Britain without a navy. Might have wanted to think about that before he launched the war. 
But nevertheless, Britain was no existential threat to the Germans at this point either. They didn't have an army to, to, to get back to the continent. And then Hitler decided to attack his ally, the Soviet Union. And that's in June of 1941. July of 1940. And the German failure to act decisively against a wobbly Great Britain immediately after the fall of France. Heck, maybe it was 1939 and the decision to launch the war in the first place which was to take on naval powers without a navy. It's one way of describing the German strategic problem in 1939. I don't know. I don't know what the turning point of World War II was. But I do know this. By 1943, whatever slim chance the Germans had, 5 10% to win this war in the first place, had slipped away. Germany first failed to subjugate Britain and then saw its armies trapped in Russia and then declared war on the United States. In short, it was now trapped in a war of attrition against superior enemies. And it's hard to imagine a way out of that problem. You see, this is depressing, I, I, I admit. Here's the thing about 1943, though. The war may have changed. But it was the same old Wehrmacht, the same old German army, still trying to do the same thing it had done in the war's first three years, perhaps the only thing it knew how to do. And that was to fight maneuver warfare, to fight Bewegungskrieg on the operational level. It was an army that stressed fighting power. Kampfkraft is the German term. Over less glamorous aspects of war making like administration or logistics, or intelligence, or counterintelligence, all of which were among the worst in the field in, in World War II. Polish military intelligence completely penetrated German counterintelligence before the war began, sort of spirited out the German code-making machine, the, the famous Enigma machine. While the Germans have historically produced great philosophers of war, like Clausewitz, supposed to applaud, my seminar is here, I know. They're supposed to be here. <laughs> I accept those applause. Carl couldn't be here this evening to accept those applause. <laughs> there are great philosophers of war in the German tradition, of course. Clausewitz, uh, Hans von Moltke, uh, General von Zeigt after World War uh, I. But the Germans have also had an abiding respect for the man of action. The muddy boots general, the hard charger, you can choose your metaphor. World War II field marshals, like Erich von Manstein, or Eberhard von Mackensen, or Walter Model, were not so much brilliant theoreticians of war as they were highly aggressive practitioners of it. And the same is true as you dive deeper down the chain of command. Uh, the division and corps commanders of the German army in World War II deserve a lot more attention, I think, than they've gotten up till now. There's a book waiting to be uh, written there. Uh, let me give you an example. General Paul Conrad, who is not a household name, even to readers of, of books about World War II, but he commanded the Hermann Goering Parachute Panzer Division in the, camp, the Sicilian campaign, the Allied landing on Sicily. When I was a young boy, a parachute panzer division was something I wanted to see in action. And I've since found out they did not drop the tanks out of the back of a transport, and I've lost a bit of my, uh, a bit of my romance. It was, a low, it was a ground division with Luftwaffe personnel, so I had the designation parachute. Now, this was the division that gave the U.S. Army all that it could handle during the invasion of Sicily. Conrath once summed up his art of war in what I would consider to be some fairly non-artistic terms. He was talking to his superior, uh, Field Marshal Kesselring, who was the uh, commander-in-chief of the Mediterranean Theater. And Kesselring said, Conrath, are you ready? The Allies are going to land in Sicily. Are you ready? And Conrath answered, with pretty, which words that should be immortal, you want an immediate, reckless rush at the enemy? I'm your man. Now that phrase sums up the Army's operational precis for 1943. Th this was a rotten year across the board. At sea, the Allies finally managed to bring the U-boat threat under control and the big month there, black month of the German U-boats, May of 1943, 
new, tech, new sonar technologies, new convoy techniques, and the U-boats, uh, uh, several dozen U-boats were sunk in that single month of only maybe 120 in the, uh, in, in the water at the time. Likewise, in the air, despite a slow start to the combined bomber offensive, the Allies torched their first great German city in the summer of 1943. It was Hamburg, the first, but of course not the last to suffer that fate. Now, despite what was looking more and more like strategic collapse, the Army spent the year on the attack almost everywhere in 1943. In early uh, 1943, March, the end of the 42-43 winter sequence, uh, Field Marshal Monstein launched a contra stroke at Kharkov that smashed a pair of Soviet armies. In July, there was the great offensive at Kursk, Operation Citadel. There was a series of German offensives in Tunisia with the blow against the U.S. Army uh, at the Kasserine Pass in February being the best known. Uh, it was the first time the Americans had met the uh, Germans in battle. And the results were not exactly encouraging for the Allies. Uh, there were some hard words from our, uh, our British ally after the, after the relatively inept opening to the Kasserine Pass operational sequence. Began referring to US, US, the U.S. soldier, the U.S. infantryman as Alice, calling the American army our Italians. I'm Italian, so I can get away with that. But it was, those were fighting words, of course, between allies. In July, the allies invaded Sicily, uh, Operation Husky. So what we're doing here is coming up from victory in, eventual allied victory in Tunisia up to Sicily and from there to, uh, from there to Italy. Operation Husky was a success, eventually, within weeks. The first day and a half were very, very sketchy indeed. The, the, the American force that landed in south-central Sicily, near the town of Jela, uh, wound up with a German panzer division sort of in its face within hours of the landing. You know, the nightmare for, uh, for amphibious troops is that there's some formed unit within a day's march of the beach that can hit the landed troops before they've really uh, coalesced into a solid beachhead. That's precisely what happened to the Americans at Sicily. Uh, and, and that is courtesy of General Conroth of the Hermann Goering Parachute Panzer Division. A reckless, a mad, reckless rush at the enemy, he said, I'm your man. And that's what the Americans had to put up with at, on Sicily. In September, they the, they, the Allies, not just the Americans, followed up the Sicilian invasion by invading mainland Italy. And this is Operation Avalanche. This time, the U.S. landing force at Salerno got six German panzer or mechanized divisions in their face within the opening days of that campaign and came very close to being driven into the sea. Probably as close as any uh, amphibious force in the European theater in World War II came to actually being driven into the sea. That is to say, their commander was, cons was seriously considering evacuating his headquarters. And that'd be General, who? That'd be General Mark Clark. I, I, I teach in Texas now. We, my, my, our family lives in Denton, Texas. I'm a faculty member at the University of North Texas. And I once gave a talk down there, and I, I, met, I said some things about Mark Clark that were relatively favorable in Texas. And I will never make that mistake again. I'll be happy to go into the gory details if you'd like to know. I survived the encounter, but just barely. Again, it came, the Americans at Salerno came very close to being driven back into the sea. Uh, I said Clark was considering evacuating. The Ger German commanders on the site sent dispatches that said the Americans are leaving. It certainly looked like an evacuation was in process. In other words, in 1943, in every way, it was the same old Wehrmacht, always aggressive, uh, whether the aggression was necessarily wise or not, and with a tight focus on the immediate enemy, leaving broader strategic questions more or less untouched. Now, that's what the Germans did in 1943, but I think there's a bigger question. And the question is, what might they have been thinking? And this... My most recent book is a piece called the, the, the Wehrmacht Retreats, and it's about this 1943 year. And you know, Tunisia is a fairly well-known operation. Kasserine Pass has been an American obsession. 
Sicily, big amphibious op. People love reading about that. Nice self-contained campaign, several weeks in duration. Then there's the drama in Italy. Mark Clark, Salerno. Uh, Rick Atkinson did this up in style in his book, The Day of Battle. If you've never had a chance to read Atkinson's The Day of Battle, I'd urge you to do it before you go to bed tonight. <laughs> it's, a nice it's an assignment because it's a nice big, big book. People know those campaigns and operations pretty well, but I don't think what has gotten perhaps sufficient attention is just what the German officer corps who was leading these campaigns might have been thinking, exactly what they thought they were doing. Were they thinking? You know, by 1943, rationality told the officer corps that the war was lost. And in fact, they admitted it often enough in their writings and commentary and interviews and post-war memoirs. That's rationality. But tradition, reinforced in a thousand different ways, urged them all to keep the faith and to keep going. It might have been in 1943 and on, it might have been easier simply to fight the war than to stop and think about the way the war was going. It's a daily task that could, that could satisfy an officer's interest in the operational art and that could, that could fill up the hours of a day. But standing back and saying, well, we're gonna launch, an, we're gonna launch a counteroffensive at Salerno. Standing back and saying, what will that eventually gain us? I, I think never really got a lot of attention. One old Prussian tradition, and the German army had come out of the Prussian tradition largely, was the Totenritt, the death ride. It was an order that you carried out, costa es wasser vola, what, whatever it takes, whatever it costs, something you didn't question. Uh, in a sense, yours is not to, to reason why. Yours is but to do or die. We have the tradition in, in, in the charge of the light brigade. Perhaps that's what the Germans were doing in 1943. No one can deny they paid a price for this kind of thinking. Uh, you can picture this officer corps at war. Uh, SS General Paul Hauser with his one eye. General Hans Huber fighting at Salerno uh, with his one arm. General Walter Nehring assembling a rickety defense in front of Tunis while constantly having to change the bandage on a festering uh, arm wound. General Hare, commanding at the Salerno Beach, divisional commander, while shaking off the effects of a recent head wound that was really only a couple of months old. General Fisher, commander of the 10th Panzer Division in Tunisia, paying the ultimate price for driving into an unmarked minefield. They fought, they suffered, and they died in droves. Well over 100 German, officer, uh, 100 German generals were killed in the course of World War II. The number is 150. I don't have the exact number in my mind. It's the order of magnitude. They died in droves, and of course, so did the men under their command. Together, they fought so hard that Germany literally had to be destroyed to bring the war to an end, which is a relatively unprecedented event. Uh, when I was growing up, the destruction of Germany in World War II seemed like the most ordinary and common event in, in the world. But as I've gone, gotten older and, and studied more military history and gone back and looked at other wars, it's a very rare event indeed. Someone comes to their senses at some point and asks for terms. That's usually how wars come to an end. That's not how this one did, of course. Now this, to me, fighting until destruction, is the real problem of the war year 1943. The Germans have a great word. You know, they have a word for everything. <laughs> the problematic. It's the problematic. It's a series of interrelated problems. And here's the first. The war was lost. And a lot of smart minds in the officer corps recognized it. And yet, Hitler had no trouble finding commanders who would continue to serve loyally, even enthusiastically, for the rest of the war. For every officer who finally said, I don't think this is going well, and some did come to their senses, there was always a line. There was a line outside the door waiting to replace them. Hitler had spent the war hiring and firing. Uh, much like Stalin or Churchill or, or any CEO, the American army got its firing out of the way before it entered the war, after the Louisiana maneuvers, when a big chunk of the officer corps, a big chunk of the general ranks were, were weeded out and you know, younger officers put in their place. But, but by and large, he didn't kill people. 
Oh, he killed all kinds of people. He didn't kill his own officers. Stalin killed his own officers in great numbers. But by and large, Hitler, Hitler fired people. So he'd spent the, year, the, the war years up till now hiring and firing. But in the course of 1943, he finally assembled the team he wanted. By now, he believed, and he was on record as saying this many, many times, that the time for large-scale mobile warfare, the way the Germans had played ball from the beginning, operations in the classic style, as he, as he uh, phrased it, that era was over. By the end of 1943, the generals who wanted to operate, the Germans have the verb operare, it means operate, to fight mobile warfare were by and large gone. Monstein got fired. Uh, General Kluge and Kleist on the army group level. General uh, Hermann Hoth of the 4th Panzer Army, one of the most aggressive of the army commanders in the German officer corps. Now, in their place, these clever guys were gone. In their place were tough guys with firm jaws. Field Marshal Ferdinand Schorner or Lothar Rendelich or Walter Model, a little less well-known to the West. The issue was not that they were bunglers. This is how it's often written up. That Hitler got rid of the smart generals and put his bunglers into, into their places, those who would obey him unquestioningly. They were, by and large, competent professionals. They'd been to the right schools and knew how to draw up an order of battle. What, what really me recommended them to Hitler, however, was that each was a stander, the German term, the stare or stander. Someone who would stay put and stand fast where he was told to. They weren't operators, clever guys like Manstein. They weren't general staff officers who sat around staring at maps all day, perhaps Hitler's least favorite colleagues in the high command. They were men of will who considered retreat a personal insult and who were willing to fight to the last German soldier in a hopeless war. I, I, I don't want for a moment anyone to think that I'm recommending this as a course of action. Schoener had hundreds, even thousands, of his own soldiers shot in order to keep the others in line and to prevent the collapse of discipline on his front. You may know this statistic. The Germans handed down roughly 25,000 death sentences against their own troops in World War II. Uh, how many of those death sentences were actually carried out is questionable. The records are completely partial toward the end of the war. But let's assume that the traditional efficiency of Nazi Germany was on display here. And that most of those 22,000 death sentences, in fact, were carried out, the vast majority of them. Um, by the way, in World War I, the Germans had handed down 16 death sentences for cowardice, desertion, and here 22,000. In Italy, of course, Hitler had to his delight found the purest stander of them all, and that's Field Marshal Albert von Kesselring. Beneath the standers were the Konrats and the Hubas and the Balks and the Hares, others I've already mentioned. You know, it may have been a beaten army, but it was still a highly lethal instrument. And in standing those last two years, the casualties that it inflicted on the Allies were enormous. Casualties inflicted on the Soviet army in the last four months of the war. That is the last January, February, March, and April of 1945 before Hitler's suicide. Approach one million. Now, the handwriting was on the wall. What the Germans called the Mene Tekel, Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 5, sees handwriting on the wall. And of course, it means that you've been weighed in the balance and found wanting. In a perfectly rational world, they would have risen up, overthrown Hitler, and sued for peace. And in fact, a few of them tried to do just that. As I hope we all know, in July of 1944, there was an attempt to kill Hitler. Not by the generals, but by, uh, by the colonels. I've gotten to know my share of colonels, and they're independent-minded people. And that was likewise in, in Hitler's Germany. But you know, none of us is a fully rational uh, being. And the, this officer corps was well past caring. It was marching to the sound of the guns as it had done for centuries. Its blood was up, and all it had left was a one-sided call to action. You know, I pondered this, and I think I finally made sense out of it. 
1943, the journal that had served as a forum for ideas within the officer corps since the Napoleonic period, it's called the Military Volkenblatt, the Military Weekly, been published uninterruptedly since 1816. And it went out of business in 1943. The Germans stopped publishing it. It no longer had a raise on debt. What was there left to talk about? I mean, that'd be a gloomy magazine by 1944. To commit fully to the death ride, you had to substitute faith, I suppose, for rationality. But perhaps you had to stop thinking altogether. But I'd like to finish with the discussion yet of why. I think it's punting to say, well, they probably weren't thinking very hard. If they had thought harder, they probably would have stopped the war. I think they were thinking about some things. And historians have kind of meticulously gone through these. Um, we often argue that what kept the German officers in the field was their fear of the Red Army's revenge. If the Red Army broke into Germany, there was going to be hell to pay. And, and that's true enough. And they had good reason to be worried. Others argue that it was Hitler. Either their fear of Hitler or their loyalty to Hitler. Flip sides of the same coin, I suppose. If I had a dime for every time I've read in a memoir, I went in intending to argue with Hitler. But there was something hypnotic about that blue eyed piercing stare, and I just went to pieces. I walked out shaking. Now, I personally don't buy that for a minute, but it does get written a lot that Hitler had some hypnotic or perhaps even demonic power. I'm no theologian, so I will leave that to the theologians. But people do write it a lot. And others say, of course, I feared Hitler. I feared for my family, and you would too. And we have to be kind of, you know, if you're a family person, you have to be sensitive to that. I will say once again that by and large, Hitler let people resign who were no longer, who no longer felt they could carry out their duties. Uh, then some of those officers tried to kill Hitler, and then he killed a boatload of them. And we have, you know, that's, that's in, by, after mid-1944. But by and large, again, the officer corps that should have been the most worried about being killed was the Red Army officer corps in the first couple years of the, of the Soviet war against the Germans. But nevertheless, the arguments do center on Hitler, either your fear or your admiration or your, the fact that you were hypnotized by him. And again, I suppose that's true enough. No one wants to read Hitler out of the story of World War II. But I do think we need to nuance this a bit. If there was one experience, one shared experience, one searing experience that linked members of the German officer corps in World War II, it was the end of World War I. When they believed they had been on the verge of winning the war until they had been stabbed in the back by a, by a wavering home front. And the groups on the home front who did the stabbing could vary from, from depending on the officer you're talking about, yeah, but, but the usual suspects, socialists, pacifists, national socialist conception, Jews, communists, an unholy coalition that had somehow come together to stab the German army in the back. Now, that may not have been true, and in fact, as a historian of World War I, I don't believe it is true. I do World War II, but I, I, to do World War II, you have to look at the German army in World War I. Germans were beaten pretty soundly by the end of World War I in the field, just like the Allies always maintained. We have good Dr. Nyberg in the back, and he can come up here and share my honorarium for this talk. <laughs> but that's not just, it, it's not true. It's not to say that many German officers didn't believe it. I, I, I think many of them did believe it. I think they'd heard it said enough times, they'd repeated the tropes and the myths enough times that they eventually began to internalize them. And if there was one thing that I'm not surprised about in World War II, it's that this officer corps promised to fight on until midnight till 10 past midnight, if that's what it took. This time there wasn't going to be a stab in the back. The Germans were gonna fight this war out to what proved to be an extremely, uh, an extremely bitter end. You know, they did just that, and they might have done just that, even if somebody else was in charge. 
Maybe in Hitler, maybe Hitler didn't hypnotize them. Maybe in Hitler, they had finally found the do or die leader they'd been yearning for since 1918 and 1919. Every one of these officers had fought in the previous war, of course, particularly when we talk about general level officers, they'd had long careers and we're only going back a, a couple of decades. And perhaps in Hitler, they had finally found the man they were looking for. You know, finally, I don't think it's unfair to point out that they were worried about themselves. We all are. Near the end of the war, many of them sat in British prisons, unaware that their captors were taping their conversations. Uh, gentlemen don't open each other's mail, a U.S. diplomat said before World War II when talking about should we put some spies in, into the Axis camp. But the, the experience of World War II, that was the least of the horrible things that happened is that people began to, to uh, um, uh, wiretap each other, to read each other's mail in a certain sense. But many of them sat in British prisons and they were unaware they were being taped. In, in one bleak moment, one of them suddenly realized the gravity of it all, the wrong turn they'd all taken. We used to be colonels and generals. General Robert Zattler blurted out one night. But after this war, we're going to be shoeshine boys and bellhops. The most respected social category in German society was the officer corps. And they knew that was over. His complaint might be the best epitaph of all for 1943. The war was lost, but the officer corps remained loyal to the regime and to the fight. In so doing, they signed a death warrant, not only for millions of soldiers and civilians, of course, but for their own caste as well. The campaigns of 1943 were not just the beginning of the end for World War II, but for one of the longest running acts on the European historical stage, the Prussian-German Officer Corps. So that's my prepared remarks tonight, and I'm prepared to also answer any questions or comments that you might like to throw at me. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Students who've been in my class know that what I should have done right now is drop mic. <laughs> so uh, my lads here will, you'll, you'll, you get the people in the... Please wait till the mic comes to you, though. Before we uh, get to the questions, I'd have to say I see a lot of my students from seminars 24 and 25 in the room, and I, it's so good to see seminar 25. It really is. No, I, I can't believe that. Sorry. <laughs> you, knew, uh, you, you knew that. You knew that was coming. So. <laughs> I think they come and get you, so. Yeah, I, have, I have a question. Uh, where am I looking, please? Corner. Front corner. There you go. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> What role did the oath uh, that German officers took to Hitler personally, not to a constitution, yeah, right. but Hitler personally, personally have to do with their loyalty to the bitter, bitter end, especially considering the concept of honor in the, uh, in the officer corps? No, this is a, obviously, it's a very good question. And virtually every officer who wrote his memoirs after the war said, well, we, we were trapped. We had taken an oath to, to, to Hitler. And I, you know, you, you parsed it in, in such a way, you said it was a oh, personal oath as opposed to an oath to an institution or a constitution. And perhaps that was, uh, th that makes some kind of qualitative difference, but let's look at those other oaths. The German officer corps took oaths of allegiance to the Weimar Constitution in the 1920s and 30s, that is the uh, Constitution of the German Republic, and that didn't seem to stop them from violating that oath. Uh, in the 1940s and 50s, they perjured themselves repeatedly during their war crimes trials contradicted by the written evidence. And so apparently that oath didn't mean too much. So uh, there, there's oaths and there's oaths. And there are some we take uh, I, to, to have and to hold for a lifetime. I intend to keep that one. Uh, to, per, perhaps others, by my constitution, uh, swear to tell the truth in, in, in court, swearing on the Bible. The officer corps' concept of the oath could be quite elastic. I'll just, I'll, I'll just say that. So I believe what linked them to Hitler was not the oath so much as the things Hitler gave them and what they supported. He promised to overthrow the democratic constitution, something they wanted. He promised to rearm the country, something they wanted. 
Promised to restore Germany's self-respect, something they wanted. Promised to start a war, at the very least to destroy Poland. Perhaps not this gigantic war, maybe they didn't want that. But, but of course, the, the invasion of Poland led to this. And that was extremely popular within the officer corps. The day the chief of the general staff, uh, Hal, uh, Franz Halder, Hitler said, we're invading Poland in two weeks, whatever the date was. Halder said, a stone has fallen from my heart. The happiest day of his life, apparently. Poland had been carved out of German and Russian territory, and, and it was a, sort of at least the very first step for German expansionism was to destroy Poland, and the officer corps supported that. After the plot to kill Hitler, the officer corps, many of the officers, Heinz Guderian, sat on hastily uh, rigged up um, courts martial, which sentenced many of his fellow officers to death for violation of the oath against Hitler. So there's, there are oaths that they kept and there are oaths that they didn't keep. I, I don't mean to be a moral arbiter. Again, I'm not a theologian. And at some point you answer, I think, to a higher power for what you've done in your lifetime. I do believe that. But I don't mean to be the one who condemns them because God knows we're all human beings and we all, make this, we, we all do things we're embarrassed by, ashamed of, wish we hadn't done, secrets we keep. Every, we're all human beings. As a corporation, as a corporate body, the, the German officer corps certainly had a great deal to answer for in terms of, of the plasticity of its oath. I'll just say that. So am I mic'd right now? Oh, okay. Right. Oh. <laughs> right. You right. You, uh, you speak quite correctly, I believe, about the ultimate irrationality of the Germans German Army's decision to keep on fighting uh, after uh, from the beginning in 1943, even when any kind of rational calculation must have told them that they were defeated. But yet you did not mention anything about the demand for unconditional surrender, which sort right. of places them in a bind. I mean, uh, a general slash politician with any foresight could have seen that one way or another, Germany is going to be divided amongst the occupying powers with or without two more years of war. That's a good point, no, uh, and it, it, needs, it needs to be responded to. And I think it is a good point. We, we could debate the rightness or wrongness of the unconditional surrender policy from, from now until doomsday, and we'll have different uh, opinions in the hall. Certainly, again, I'm an expert in the, the memoirs and the interviews done with the German generals after the war. Virtually, to a man, they mentioned this. What did you expect us to do after an, a, 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 a declaration that the Allies were fighting for unconditional surrender, Germany would stop at nothing less. Now, it is interesting that at the time that it was declared, opinions within the German resistance, such as the German resistance was at the time, uh, disparate groups, a fairly inchoate resistance to Hitler, uh, were not unanimously against it. They said, well, at least this is putting, th this is telling the officer corps what's up, what they're going to get. They, what they were worried, what the resistance was worried about, is that they would show their hand, and then there'd be some negotiated peace, which would leave some form of national socialism in power. And of course, then that's, you've just, I suppose, signed your own, your own death warrant. But off the top of my head, when I hear unconditional surrender, wh while I can understand it as a political move to weld the alliance together, it seems to me to be an overly rigid strategic posture. That at the end of the day, the war has to be a political act. War and politics have to be linked, and that there's always room for negotiation and wiggle room in politics. What, what I think solidifies unconditional surrender as a viable policy and as the right thing to do at the time was Hitler. This just appeared to be a regime with which there could be no sound basis for negotiation. Too much water had gone under the bridge, too many, uh, too many uh, treaties had been signed and violated, too many promises had been made and then uh, reneged upon. And so I think at least in this one case, unconditional surrender probably makes a certain amount of sense. I believe if there had, even if there hadn't been an unconditional surrender policy, I think the war might have turned out very similar to the way it did. Go ahead. In the, uh, in the last few weeks of the war, over here. Thank you. In the last few weeks of the war, did any of the general officers try to escape to Switzerland, Sweden, South America, any place? Uh, the, the most egregious, yes. The answer, short answer is yes. By and large, no. Virtually all of them went into captivity, one sort or the other. 
Most of them tried to surrender to whom? The, the, the Western allies and not to the Soviets. Pr probably sent a sensible policy. But the most egregious example, I suppose, of an officer who tried to escape was General Scherner, who commanded Army, I guess Army Group South until the very end of the war. And he was the, the disciplinarian general who had shot thousands of his own men to keep them, to keep them in line, on, usually on trumped-up charges of cowardice. Uh, toward the end of the war, he, he tried, he got a, went to the paymaster of Army Group South and got all the funds he could get, commandeered a fiesel historic aircraft, that little command aircraft that the Germans had, and, and abandoned Army Group South and tried to surrender to the Americans. Flew, flew, flew the American lines. Um, he was captured by the Americans and promptly handed back over to the Soviets. The vast majority of his army group went into Soviet captivity rather than American captivity. Soviets finally freed him in 1955, I think, sent him back to East Germany. It was part of the debate at the time over German rearmament. And the Soviets were trying to say, we got some unpleasant characters. You want to rearm West Germany, here's an unpleasant character you might be dealing with in the future. And that became a big issue at the time, the fact that he had tried what, apparently to save his own skin while abandoning his troops in the last few days of the war. So, but the vast, the vast majority, I wouldn't say, you know, they didn't harbor fantasies of escape and sailing off to, the, you know, to Argentina or, or wherever. The vast majority of them wound up as prisoners. Virtually all of them then gave interviews to the Allies, Western Allies. Those turned into the Foreign Military Study Series, which lined the shelves of, of, the, of the AHAC here. And, you know, thank God for World War II or I'd have nothing to write about. This is what I've been... I've been wading into those documents for my entire scholarly career and continue to do so. Yes, sir. In Russia in particular, do you feel <clears throat> that the confusion caused by OKW and OKH plus the firing of Brautish had any oh, sorry, the firing of? Plus the firing of Phil Marshall from Brautish. Oh. Are those three conditions, do you feel they had much of a negative impact? Without a doubt. I, I think one of the, the myths, perhaps, about the German uh, high command in World War II is that, that it was particularly efficient. But, but there certainly have been more efficient high commands in the annals of 20th century military history. So there's essentially a tripartite division. There's the high command of the army, OKH, and it runs the war in the east, that is the war against the Soviet Union. There's the high, because that's basically an army show. That's where 80% of the army is. Then there's the OKW, the High Command of the Armed Forces, Army, Navy, and Air Force. And that's North Africa, the, the Western uh, sectors. Then there's the general staff, kind of responsible for Army planning, but also some, some uh, joint planning as well. So it's very complex. Hitler created the High Command of the Armed Forces not, as you might expect, because it makes sense to coordinate land, air, and sea operations. Good, I'll support that. He did it to cut the high command of the army out of decision making because it had been the dominant body in German military planning along with the general staff up till this point. Now to Hitler, the army officers were a particularly obnoxious bunch in Hitler's worldview. They were from the high Prussian aristocracy, the Junkers from Eastern Germany, ancient names and ancient families. Hitler had a guy named Manstein who sometimes gave him trouble. Frederick the Great had someone named Manstein who, who usually gave him trouble. Hitler had Zeidlitz, who was the officer, the, the uh, commander inside Stalingrad, saying there had to be an immediate breakout. Frederick the Great had an obstreperous commander named Zeidlitz. These families were ancient. Hitler, as you may know, came from no social, what we might consider a social background at all. He had, father was a maybe lower middle class, father was a customs official for the Habsburg Empire, Adolf was orphaned at a relatively early age, not really, a, we don't really diagnose this clinically, uh, his parents were both dead by the time he was in his late teens. Hardly unusual for Europe in the late 19th century. Um, Hitler, uh, at a, a relatively young age, went to Vienna to become an artist. That failed. He spent Christmas of 1912 in a homeless shelter outside of Vienna. I mean, that's, that's, that's who Hitler was. He had, he'd risen up from the gutter, as he said. He said that repeatedly himself. So having to deal with cultured and cultivated and educated and privileged officers of the Army Office of Corps in particular was very difficult for Hitler. 
the, the, the Navy and especially the Air Force were much more Nazified. The, the Air Force had younger guys, technicians, people who like to fly. Your, your, your family, your pedigree was not so important to the Air Force or even, even the Navy. It was a relatively young service. So Hitler had done that, again, created this OKW, High Command of the Armed Forces, so that the three services would look like they were equal and he could adjudicate between them. But it was often the Navy and the Air Force ganging up two to one on the Army. You could have an infantry division in the Soviet Union was under the command of the OKH, under the administration of the OKH. And then it would have to be sh uh, shipped to France. And, not, and it, would, it would leave OKH, High Command of the Army, and go to the High Command of the Armed Forces. Then it would be transferred back to the Soviet Union, and it would happen all over again the other way, generating massive amounts of bureaucratic administrative friction and, of course, massive amounts of, of paperwork. So the, the short answer, that was a long answer. The short answer to your I even blew out the microphone in answering it. The, the short answer is yes, the, that those were all problems. You said one other factor as well, uh, Braukic's dismissal. Yeah. Uh, the, high command of the, the high commander of the army, General Walter von Braukic, uh, a pretty fanatical Nazi, married to an even more fanatical Nazi. Mrs. Braukic was an interesting character as well, Frau Braukic, was dismissed from his post as the Soviet campaign went bad in December 1941. Now, there seemed to be a health issue. The, the official the, uh, uh, paperwork said it was a heart problem. That's been called into question about how bad the heart problem was. But the campaign had gone badly, and, and Hitler was not satisfied. Now, that's fine. You, Pittsburgh Penguins got eliminated. They're going to fire the coach. We all know how that works. But, but, but the problem is when you don't hire a new coach. Hitler took over the high command of the army personally after Braukic's dismissal. He told the chief of the general staff, Franz, von, uh, Franz Halder, I love this. I'm going to say this to the next class of students at the U.S. Army War College. Th this little matter of operational uh, uh, planning, anyone can do it. <laughs> and you know, Hitler spent the rest of the war proving the falsehood of that statement. Not everyone can do it. It's very complicated and, and requires specialized training, and certainly this kind of specialized training that Hitler did not have. What he did have, of course, was a faith in his own star based on some early successes, maybe some counterintuitive guesses in the French campaign, we might say. But, but there's, there's no doubt that the, the Germans could have fought the war more efficiently if Hitler had stopped meddling in it so much. I, I don't believe that in the end the, the, the result would have been any different. Hitler, all the big decisions were Hitler's, especially to invade the Soviet Union, and then later to declare war on the United States. Kind of a two-part thing. Um, you said a couple of times that he didn't really kill a lot of his officers or anything, yeah. but towards the beginning of his career there, before he became the Fuhrer, uh, Fuhrer and like Scheschfuhrer, didn't he <coughs> kill a lot of the old World War I generals and uh, officers that were part of his SA brown shirts in that one night of the knives? Yes, right, 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 right. And that then turning into Nazi Germany, I think, took a turn with a younger enlisted people that were more in tune to the Nazi ideal. And, um, so is that, is that part one? Yeah. Let me answer it and then hold, let me answer that so I remember the, uh, remember the question and we'll get you part two in a second. Um, there had been a pretty big purge in, in June of 1930. Hitler came to power in January of 1933, about a year and a half in of uh, some, what Hitler perceived as dangerous trends within the party, particularly among his street fighting stormtrooper organization. And there was a kind of a decapitation coup against them. Ernst Röhm, the head of the stormtroopers, killed along with some of the other cronies. A handful of regular, a handful, a, a couple of officers in the regular army were also killed in that, that uh, we call it, a, call it a coup, a putsch. It's sometimes called the Röhm putsch. The Night of the Long Knives is what you call it, and that's good enough. But it, I, I'm not... Not defending the Night of the Long Knives at all, but some, some perspective. If you look at what Stalin had done to his own officer corps in the 1930s in terms of the numbers, Hitler was quite the amateur by, by comparison. 
Now, in 1938, uh, there was another move to sort of coordinate the army. The, the defense minister, Blomberg, and the chief of the army command, uh, General Fritsch, were both dismissed from their posts on trumped-up morals charges, of all things. Um, General von Blomberg had married a woman with a past. It was said at the time. This is why Wikipedia exists, so please go look that up if you wish. Other morals charges were brought against General Fritsch based on trumped up testimony from, from a street person that the SS had, uh, the Gestapo had rounded up and asked for, asked for information. So they were removed from their posts, and neither case, I mean, well, you know, this is horrible. But it's, it's, it's a gangster regime which did horrible things regularly. But neither one was killed at the time. So I, I'd have to stick, but by and large, this was not a regime that killed its own generals until some officers tried to kill Hitler in July of 1944. And then again, a, a number of them were killed horribly. And if you want to go look up the details, again, the, it's with the, why we have an internet today. Um, but, but, you know, killed in, in particularly gruesome fashion and often condemned by, you know, kind of hasty, sort of kangaroo courts of their fellow officers. It's a, it's a pretty rough situation all along. So no one should ever say, you know, Hitler, yeah, Hitler didn't really kill people. He killed all kinds of people. He's the greatest mass murderer of the 20th century. By and large, the officer corps was not a target of his most murderous impulses. And you had a second part? Yeah. Um, with the end of World War I, the German army was really based off of its own lands and was more in the land of its conquered countries whenever it surrendered. Oh, yes, yeah, right, right, right. So if I remember something I read correctly at one point, uh, people had said that they felt it was more of a draw and a drawdown and not so much of a loss on their part. And then signing that treaty and then not being allowed into the, the conversations afterwards for the League of Nations and the Treaty of Versailles... <laughs> they were alienated, and then their country was cut up into many pieces and taken away from them. So does that play, I mean, I feel like that plays a huge role in the 1943 with what you're talking about, and how could you surrender not, not even a generation later in a war that you're fighting whenever the last time you surrendered the Allies took everything you had anyways. Yeah, so I did, you know, I referenced a sort of stab in the, this notion that the German army had been stabbed in the back in World War I. But, see, this then is the danger of falling prey to, to a myth. At the end of World War I, the German armies had sustained massive defeats on all fronts, but particularly the Western Front. The Austrians were collapsing, their Bulgarian ally was collapsing. The chief of the German general staff at the time, uh, not his exact title, but it's close enough, General Erich Ludendorff, went to the civilian government and said, you must sign an armistice immediately, we're beaten. Now, 10 years later, he's the one, he's one of the people writing books and saying, our brave fighting forces were stabbed in the back by socialists on the home front. I mean, we can understand why he wrote it. People always try to exculpate themselves. Very few people write memoirs and say, and the, book, the memoir is called, My Fault by Robert M. Satino. And that would, be a, that would be a bestseller. People write books that say, you know, your fault. That's what, that's what memoirs, people sometimes say, this memoir is particularly self-serving. All memoirs are self-serving. That's why people write them, to make the best possible case. The only contrary example, St. Augustine. He called his memoirs confessions. He said every horrible thing he'd ever done in his entire life, it's a very unusual piece of literature. So you're right in a sense that this myth that had taken hold, that somehow we, the Germans, we, let's say, let's say we're the Germans here, we weren't really beaten. And I know what you, I like the way you started it. At the end of that war, we were everywhere on foreign soil. Right? We're still in occupation of most of Belgium and parts of France and, and a huge chunk of what had been Tsarist Russia. The, the German army had to come home to, to end the war. So they, they were everywhere on, on foreign soil. But the, con the country's economy had fallen apart. The, the blockade had, had, just, had practically wrecked the economy. The, the flu epidemic was hitting Germany as hard as it was hitting any place because of the, the lo you know, lower calories in the diet and the, the more and more meager diet as 1917 turned into 1918. 16 and 17, you know, the Germans started eating turnips three times a day. 
You can grind them and boil them and fry them and bake them, and that's great, man. I love turnips. But before World War I, they were feed for livestock in Germany. You know, they were hitting the dog food aisle. So, so, to, so to, you understand the point I'm making. So You're right. I mean, if that was the myth we all believe, you know, we didn't really lose that war. We're going to prove it this time by getting destroyed. Yeah. And who he be? Oh, uh, did I'm sorry. What it did? I'm not sure. What isn't that? Say that you mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, there's, oh, there's no doubt. National pride, and, and, and pride in nation was a big part of the Nazi appeal. The, many Germans felt that the Treaty of Versailles treated them unfairly. I believe it is a high exaggeration to say it tore Germany apart. It removed some border territories, about 12% of the total population, about, uh, of the total uh, area, and about 12% of the total population. Did hit, you know, steel and coal, or uh, uh, iron ore and coal reserves. Uh, there's... You, Took away all of Germany's colonies, disarmed Germany. It was a, you know, it, it, it was certainly a, a treaty with some harsh uh, clauses. By no means was it a Carthaginian treaty where Germany was destroyed and all the men were killed and the women and children sold into slavery and the land was sold with salt. In the, in the kind of exaggerated rhetoric of the day is how the Treaty of Versailles was often uh, uh, described. I, I'll give you a, a treaty in World War I that was Carthaginian. And it's the treaty the Germans imposed on defeated Russia, <laughs> which lopped off 50 million people and I, 10 million. I don't have, I have no idea how many square miles. But you know, you, it, um, if uh, if in the Treaty of Versailles the Germans lost a little bit here and a little bit there, in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk the, the, the Tsarist Russia lost most of what's on this map. So that to me, you know, I, again, I, I understand the, the 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 appeal. Hitler was able to make political hay out of a very unpopular treaty. There's no doubt about that. And he could also speak with some authority. He could say, it's all well and good for, for you f finely educated politicians to debate our problems today. I, I mean, I didn't go to your schools. I didn't get to go to university. I had a university called the Western Front. He fought on the front lines. Uh, fought supposedly pretty bravely. Some people call into question whether his medals were earned. And, that's a whole other can of worms. But, but he, he played that very, very skillfully. I do believe some of it was mythological, and that's the point I'm making. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. <laughs> no mics work tonight, Carl. Hey, Here, speak into my ear. <laughs> if I can introduce Colonel Matt Dawson, come on up and make a quick presentation. Great. If you'll stand right out here in front. Right here? I reluctantly came tonight because I knew it was Rob. <laughs> thanks, Beth. And, and now I know I wasted most of the night. So <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah, I really... In all seriousness, uh, what a great presentation. I've heard a lot of talks about World War II, read quite a bit on my own, and that's probably the finest oh, discussion you, wow. uh, that I've heard. And I hope you all would agree with me and give them a round of applause. Oh, thanks so much. I mean it. Oh, man, I, I, I appreciate that. Thanks.